Good morning from the Rusalin Observatory. I have had my uh, dwarf too for six weeks, so it is about time to do a review of uh, what I like about it. Let's get started. First of all, the unboxing. You may recall uh, it arrived about six weeks after I ordered it, and uh, everything was good. The battery was half charged, and I did find a fingerprint on the inside of the lens. First thing to do was the firmware upgrade. Uh, it was uneventful, and I posted the video, I put the link down there. Once we had upgraded the firmware, it was time to test it. Uh, it arrived during the day, so I was anxious to see what it can do. And the first test was uh, to watch it open and then find a uh, remote place on the wide angle length, double click on it, and then autofocus. And I was impressed with the quality of the focus automatically. Next, the moon was up there. So I went to the moon and uh, focusing on the moon was very nice. And uh, since there was no way to put the, the dwarf into astro mode during daytime, I used the track function to track the moon. And uh, that worked reasonably well. It was not as smooth as I would have liked it to be. So we tried it again at night. Uh, this time we tried it both with uh, astro mode and video mode. One thing worth noting, this is the first time I actually see the color of the minerals on the moon. If you look carefully, you will see the brownish and the bluish inside the craters. And uh, that was indeed impressive. The video record allows us to record short videos uh, that we can use later to stack. Uh, I like the idea of recording a video and there is a plane that transited the moon. I had not noticed that before. Autofocus. Next, even though it was a full moon, uh, it was time to check the astro mode. First thing to do was to uh, forget that there is a wide angle length because uh, I did not use it at all for astro mode. For the telephoto lens to calibrate, I set the exposure to one second. And uh, given that I live in Bortel 4, a gain of 80 seemed adequate. Looking out there, there were enough stars to do the calibration on. The difference between pass and cut. I prefer to use cut for calibration. Uh, I don't need all the infrared light. I just need a few white dots on a dark background. And then uh, go to feature and then ask it to calibrate. But that's what the dwarf was looking at. My experience had been that uh, a dozen stars is all you need to calibrate. There is calibration. The dwarf is going to close completely and that's why we're seeing the funny colors, and then reopen. It's looking to find the home position both along the azimuth and along uh, the latitude. It took the first picture. It conducted the plate solving. This is real time. Uh, I did not accelerate or speed up this video. This is the time lapse. 
this is not a time lapse. Second calculation, and then third calculation. My experience has been that unless it is cloudy, calibration succeeds on the first go. Successful. These are the three pictures that it took. Picture two and picture three. And they were enough to give it information as to where it is located in the sky. Go to, as you can see, <laughs> Satellite just passed by the Pinwheel Galaxy. Another satellite has just gone by. It moved to the Pinwheel Galaxy and started plate solving. Again, plate solving takes only 15 seconds or so, which is incredibly fast given the complexity of the computation. Confirm that we are in business. Now we can start the stacking. There's the histogram. Right now, Dwarf does not allow us to reduce binning from 2 times 2 pixels to 1. I look forward to that. Uh, it's going to slow things down quite a bit. At the end of the night, this is what I ended up with. Pinwheel Galaxy and a lot of hot pixels. I was blown away by the number of hot pixels that made me wonder if Dwarf is buying uh, Sony Reject chips to be able to uh, afford to sell it for uh, so little money. So it was time to take some darks. I like to use a suitcase that is totally black, my Pelican suitcase, put the dwarf in it and uh, close it and turn the lights off in the room obviously and then uh, uh, take the darks. The reason I prefer this one over their bag is the bag is gray on the inside and uh, since the dwarf insists on turning the lights on, even when we turn them off, I did not want to take that chance. Uh, this is a sped up time lapse of the darks, and that's what they looked like. It took just about 10 minutes for it to take all the pictures. It was fascinating watching the dark image being formed. And then I went back and retook the Pinwheel Galaxy, and that is the difference between no darks and darks. Beyond taking, uh, beyond imaging what is in the catalog, the dwarf allows us to enter the right ascension and declination of any target in, in the heavens. Uh, I wanted to see what it does with the Mercarian's chain, with M86 and company. Uh, given that the field of view of the dwarf is 3 degrees, which makes it ideal for the Mercarian's chain. Uh, these are the coordinates of uh, somewhere in the middle of that chain. That uh, thumb wheel to enter things is... Uh, Takes some getting used to. I would have preferred to just type in the RA and DEC, but uh, it works this way. And these are the coordinates. And then confirm. And then uh, once we hit confirm again, it's going to go there. Plate solving. And then once plate solving is done, success. We can start uh, 
stacking. I put it at the maximum count because I can always stop it before the 999. My preference for imaging is to go with 10 seconds and uh, leave it at uh, a gain of 80. I tried 5 seconds, I tried 8 seconds, I tried 10 seconds. Uh, I settled eventually at 10 seconds. Usually when I'm imaging deep sky objects, if, it's, if it has nebulosity in it, I put the IR infrared filter on pass. If it's just a galaxy of stars with no known nebulosity, I prefer to put uh, IR cut. It gives me a cleaner uh, picture at the end. 999, exposure 5 seconds, gain 30. And once it starts stacking, it's going to show the stacked at the top right. And there we go. I'm going to speed that one up because uh, it would take a very long time otherwise. I was pleasantly surprised that uh, the dwarf does not reject too many frames. But, uh, and this was uh, later on in the process, showing satellites go through. You have the ability to adjust the histogram, but I have not been able to um, master that histogram yet. It does not allow me to move the midpoint the way I'd like to. And these are the the main galaxies within the Mercurian's chain, M84, M86. Now, <clears throat> because it is an alt as mount, Merc the dwarf tends to show field rotation. Uh, this is an attempted mount on a equatorial mount, and you can see that uh, there is no field rotation here, just the shifting. I'm concerned with using an equatorial mount because it puts uh, torsional pressure on the gears, so I don't use it often. Then it was time to test the dwarf in uh, Bortle 2, took it to the Adirondacks, and that is a comparison between Bortle 4 and Bortle 2 images. Obviously, it did much better with the Bortle 2. The Sun. Uh, love at first sight, its ability to find the sun by using wide angle and then double clicking on it and going to telephoto. The uh, very first time I pointed the dwarf to the sun, it uh, saw the sunspots. And uh, double clicking on it allowed us to uh, focus. The clouds uh, did not make much difference. Uh, last but not least, uh, this is the concoction that I built using a drill press vise with rubber jaws to avoid putting any pressure on the dwarf. This allows me to straddle my window and uh, this has been uh, exclusively the setting that I've used the dwarf in, even with a narrow window, I'm able to get hours worth of uh, filming with the dwarf. So at the end, was it worth it? Of course it was. And uh, I look forward to using it for a long, long time.